Okay, I'm going to propose we go ahead and start up here again. I, we're, we're a little bit, uh, since we have plenty of time for today, I don't think this presentation is going to take an hour and a half. I'd like to make sure we have some time for some discussion afterwards. Before we begin with the final presentation of the day on the containment, uh, do we have any questions from anybody? Anything uh, you need to uh, you want us to clarify for now, or as Marco said, we do have a you know we have some discussion time built in at the end of each day for uh, w which is intended to give us an opportunity to have some open discussion about what we talked about during that day, so we can open the floor at that point. So, all right. So having said that, let's uh, move into the next system that we're going to uh, discuss today, the containment. What I'm going to try to do today is follow a similar pattern to what we've done all day so far, talk about some of the specific safety requirements, go through some examples of different types of systems, and then I'll talk about some specific information related uh, to some actual uh, um, sample calculations that I wanted to show you. And really what I want to try to emphasize there is some of the linkages between the calculations that we do in the reactor itself, using that information as a source term, if you will, to then calculate the loads that we have to deal with in our containment. So that's kind of how I'd like to structure this presentation today. But So let me begin by going through some discussions regarding the design requirements. Um, you know, this is, I, I wanted to talk about this just to kind of put a little background overlaying everything I want to talk about this afternoon. We think about radiation protection, it's, it's basically, you know, we can put it in terms of time, distance, shielding. In this case, shielding is barriers. Um, these are the, you know, these are the, the, the basic high-level concepts that we use when we think about trying to protect ourselves from a radioactive material. Uh, uh, obviously, barriers in this case or shielding are intended to contain radioactive material. Obviously, obviously, you know, one such system is the containment inside the reactor. As we just learned, we have the reactor coolant system is another system which is intended to contain radioactivity. And we talked about the fuel and the reactor core earlier today before lunch. We, uh, we think about distance. Well, you know, distance is another way we can protect ourselves from the radiation and also time. Some of the philosophies regarding containments are, you know, and in some cases, some people refer to them as, some structures are called a confinement structure. Some of the principles in place are, this is, you know, this is with existing plants. This is not a concept that we would apply to a new plant, but some of the existing plants, containment structures are really more there to give us time for some, you know, for some accident sequences for, to take necessary emergency protective actions if we, you know, if we had a severe event, but that's not a concept that we're going to apply to a new plant. You know, we would like to be able to design a containment structure which would, which would function, you know, to uh, uh, um, actually be able to contain all the radioactive material from a given set of accident sequences. Okay, so think about again, we're always thinking about the fence in depth. This is a concept we apply across the board with anything that we do. This is just sort of a summary picture of the different kinds of barriers. We've talked about all of these already. The containment structure is number four. Actually, I guess we didn't talk about the last one um, yet. I, I added emergency preparedness or emergency measures in there as a, potential, as a potential level of defense and death because, again, we're always thinking about how we, can, you know, how we can take actions to protect the public and the environment. One way we can protect people is to just simply move them out of the way. If we have a situation where, you know, it, 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 if we go through the emergency plan at a nuclear power plant, they're going to establish a set of what are called emergency action levels. And these are basically uh, what these are, a set of instructions for actions to take given a certain set of plant parameters. If I start losing critical safety functions, which are things that I need in order to be able to provide for core cooling or, or the long-term integrity of the containment, then my EALs will direct me to evacuate people. And that's, uh, this is another level of defense in depth that we will take. And, and uh, if you follow the emergency plans as they're described by the IAEA, one will take those actions irregardless of whether or not we actually do indeed have a release from the facility. They're going to be taken based on the conditions in the plant at the time. So again, it's a level of defense in depth. Okay, so getting now specifically to the, the actual systems that we've talked about, 
again, these numbers are intended to be representative of different types of systems. These are not exact numbers. We think about a containment. Typically, it's going to be like, you know, uh, roughly a 1 to 1.2 concrete structure, or a thick walled concrete structure. You know, we could have in some, um, some reactors will have like a biological shield, if you will, around the reactor, which is about approximately one more meter in width. We'll have the reactor pressure vessel itself, and then we get down into the fuel and the fuel rods, which we've already talked about. Okay, so what I've done here, these aren't exact, uh, these aren't exact representations of the requirements in SSR 2 slash 1. I wanted to kind of paraphrase them a little bit, but, but, but let me just work through this first one here. This is, this states that a containment system shall be provided in order to ensure that any release of radioactive materials to the environment in a design basis accident would be below prescribed limits. Now, when you read that, what does that mean to you? You know, what does below prescribed limits mean? Okay. Okay, that's one thing. And yeah, exactly. We have limits in normal operation. We want to maintain the releases of the plant below, you know, below prescribed regulatory limits. Okay. I mean, where I'm getting at here is we, we, we think about a containment. You know, all containments have a design leak rate. It, it's not possible to build a structure that big, which is going to have zero leakage. I mean, it's just simply not possible to do it. So we always have a prescribed allowed leak rate, which we have to consider, as you said, during normal operations, for example. You know, the plant has a certain amount of allowed effluent release, which is going to be controlled by national regulatory authority, national requirements. We have to maintain those values below that. Now, we think about an accident condition. You know, those limits, you know, um, are going to be set by the member state regulatory authority of what they're willing to accept for a given set of accidents, be it an AOO, be it a DBA, be it a, 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 a deck condition, for example. Uh, you know, uh, but they may have different allowed limits. But the key here is, is, you know, we're not saying in the safety standards, you know, zero release. I mean, that is, that is just not practical. Because of the way containments are built, the structures are, are massive, they're huge. It's, it's not possible to have a zero leakage building. So we have to take that into consideration in our standards. Um, you, you know, what this, depending on design requirements, well, it, it says leak tight structures, but again, that's within the, that's within the design leak rate of the system. Some of the other things we have to think about when we're considering how we design our containment to meet this requirement, we have to think about the associated systems for the control of pressure and temperature. I have some examples of that later on in the presentation. You know, we have to be able to remove heat. We have to be able to, um, we have, we have to, be able to lower the pressure in the containment. If we don't, then it's going to be very difficult to meet these requirements. It's very difficult to build a building which is going to be able to accept and contain all of the energy from the reactor system and the associated decay heat inside this, inside this isolated structure over a long period of time without some mechanism of removing energy from that building. Okay. We have to think about, you know, how are we going to isolate the containment? You know, we, uh, if we look at a containment, you know, it has a bunch of pipes going through it, you know, we, we have to get the steam from the steam generator to the turbine, so there's a, so, so there's a pipe penetration. We have, to, we have to have pipes coming in from external tanks. We have to have, uh, you know, we have to have the ability to get instrumentation lines through containment. So we have to, have, you know, we have penetrations in containment, okay? But in order to have a truly leak tight, again, within the design leak rate of the containment, I have to be able to isolate those penetrations. So I have to have a valving system is what, is, what is, is what designers typically do on each of those penetrations, which would close in, you know, on, well, within a certain set of prescribed conditions, which, you know, which have been pre-designed. Uh, this is something that, that realistically should be an automatic action you know, to isolate containment. Well, what you typically find required by national regulations is to have a, a valve inside the containment wall and outside the containment wall for each of these penetrations. Again, that just adds an additional level of redundancy to this isolation function. Okay. We have to think about the management and, and, and removal of fission products, you know, um, hydrogen, oxygen, other substances like this, for example. You know, hydrogen, why do I have to worry about hydrogen in a containment? 
because, yeah, because it's a potential explosive gas. As Again, as we saw from Fukushima, hydrogen is an extremely explosive substance when the right conditions are present. Okay, and, and that's a key... Uh, that's a key qualifier. Hydrogen, you know, just by itself, is not an explosive substance. It has to have it has to have the right concentration of hydrogen and oxygen under the right pressure temperature conditions in order to have an explosive mixture. But we're thinking about design of our containment. We have to consider the possibility that we could have a situation where we have severe core damage. Of course, we all have. You know, we've learned throughout the course of these last couple of days. Obviously, that will lead to the production of hydrogen from the oxidation of the zirconium alloy cladding, we have to figure out something to do with that hydrogen. It's really not a good idea to just leave it in the containment. And I have some examples of different design concepts for how, for how these combustible gases have been dealt with by different designers over the years. Okay. The last bullet here is really just sort of a scope question. We have to think about, again, we have to think about a large set of what we call the identified design basis accidents, and that's going to lead to a series of loads in the containment that I have to think about as I'm designing my containment. You know, what is the maximum load that I have to design to? Um, and then we also, again, have to think about severe, well, here it says severe accidents. Again, we're transitioning here terminology. Nowadays, we'd, re uh, we'd refer more to this as a design extension condition. But we also have to consider those conditions in our containment design because we will most likely have requirements on the containment related to those. Okay. So the next requirement uh, that we need to think about is the strength of the containment structure, including access openings and penetrations and isolation valves, shall be calculated with sufficient margin on safety on the basis of the potential internal overpressures and temperatures. We have to think about things like, we have to think, we have to think about certain things like different kinds of dynamic effects. Um, we have to think about the reactive forces that arise from design basis accidents. Now, let me kind of paraphrase what that means. When I think about this, uh, you know, I think about the fact that if I have a high-pressure pipe inside my, inside the containment, and we have a whole bunch of them, you know, they're all associated with the reactor coolant system. If, if one of those pipes should break, again, this is, this is the standard, this is the basic traditional large break loss of coolant accident, what that's going to lead to is basically a jet of water or steam under those conditions because the water will flash into steam, which is going to be coming out of that pipe, which is probably going to be sitting there you know, kind of flailing around in the containment because there's nothing holding it in place. So I need to think about the effect of the impingement of that extremely high velocity, high temperature steam on internal structures. So that is, you know, that's basically like a jet impact inside the containment. I need to think about that. Is that, is that situation going to damage vital equipment? Is it, um, you know, is it going to damage the structure? These have to be considered because I don't want that to happen under those circumstances because that is, again, one of our design basis accidents, one of the things that we have to have the containment be able to handle. Okay. We have to consider the possibility of other energy sources in, um, inside the containment. For example, in this case, it mentions possible chemical or radiology or radiolysis reactions. I would put this in terms of molten concrete interaction. Have we heard the term MCCI? If you've read anything about Fukushima, you probably read MCCI. Well, what that basically is, is the corium, or the, the molten core, drops out of the bottom of the vessel, falls down to the concrete structure under the vessel. It starts a chemical reaction with the concrete. It starts to eat through the concrete. It's an exothermic chemical reaction, creates hydrogen, creates a bunch of carbon monoxide. So we have to think about those effects in our design, especially now because, again, we are now designing for these kinds of situations in our containments. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're moving on to the next requirement. In calculating the necessary strength of the containment structure, natural phenomena, and human-induced events shall be taken into consideration and provisions shall be made to monitor the containment and its associated features. So what this means to me is I need to think about instrumentation. We've talked a lot about instrumentation. I need to be able to measure the conditions inside the containment under potentially extremely hazardous conditions, extremely challenging environmental conditions is perhaps a better way to put it. What are some of the parameters I need to measure in a containment? Any, any ideas during an accident? And what do I need to know? 
as an operator. Pressure, Pressure? yeah, yeah, that's definitely. Anything else? Temperature, Temperature yeah. Hydrogen. Hydrogen concentration. Okay, you're getting the biggies. This is that. That's where I was going to go. So great. Okay, you know these. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say those three. So so let's stop there. So again, the uh, the idea is. We, we have, you have to sit down and think about it systematically. What do I need? What do the operators really need to know? And then I'm going to go to my INC specialists who are going to design a set of instruments to deal with the expected environmental conditions in the containment. So obviously an instrument is worthless to me if it melts, for example, during the accident, or if it gets damaged by a jet stream coming at it from a pipe that is just broken. It's not going to do me any good. So we have, we have to think about these things. Okay. Um, we've already talked about the severe accident, or again, I'm going back to old terminology. I apologize for that. We have to think about, about the containment's ability to, to withstand design extension conditions. Um, one of the things that's very challenging to deal with is this issue of combustible gases. That's, that's another way of saying hydrogen, generally speaking, although there are other potential combustible gases. Hydrogen tends to be the worst one. To be quite frank, I don't know of any containment that really has been designed that could handle a hydrogen explosion in the containment. I think designers will take the approach we'd rather avoid that, so we don't have to design against it. So we'll put provisions in place to allow us to ensure that we do not have an explosive mixture inside the containment environment, because it's a very, very challenging design problem to solve, and it's a very challenging design problem to prove that you've solved. Okay. So capability for, uh, we have to think about capability for testing. You know, again, as with any system, this is a safety system. We, have, we will have requirements in the plant technical specification or in the license of the plant, which require me to prove that the containment functions, not just during normal operations. I have to, uh, uh, there will be times during the operation of the plant where I have to pressurize the containment to its design point and show that it actually works. That's going to be done periodically throughout the lifetime of the facility. So I need to design the ability to do that. So that's something I have to think about. That is not an easy thing to do because containments are really, really big. And it's not an easy thing to do. Okay. Uh, leakage. Okay. Well, again, we have, you know, this is a building. It is not possible realistically, as I said, to build a building of this size, which has zero leak rate. So we have to design in an allowed maximum leak rate. And part of the testing is I prove it, that it actually meets the leak rate. If it doesn't, the operator has to shut the plant down, and they have to find out what's wrong. They have to fix it before they can restart. That's going to be a requirement in the license of the plant. Again, and what this really gets back to is demonstrating that I'm staying inside the box of my analysis. You know, and one way of dealing with that would be to go back and redo the analysis with a higher leak rate, if your regulatory authority would allow you to do that. We have to stay within the boundaries of our calculations, because that's how we make the demonstration of the safety of the plant is with the computer models. All right, penetrations. Um, talked about this. We have to ensure, basically, that the penetrations will function just as well as the containment structure itself. In other words, they become part of the containment. So they have to meet all the same design requirements. They have to be able to handle all the same loads. All the same concerns, such as internal, you know, internal jet forces, pipe whips, you know, all the all these different situations that we could postulate could exist in the containment during our suite of accidents that we're designing against. The penetrations become part of the containment structure. Uh, seals again. Seals also. If we have a seal around a penetration, you know, I mean, again, we, it's it's. I mean, this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but imagine you drill a hole in the wall and you put a pipe through, well, you have to put some sealant in between the pipe and the concrete. I mean, it's, that's, it's a little more sophisticated than that, but that's a, that's a relatively good example. That seal is the containment. It becomes part of the containment structure. That seal has to hold. It has to work under the design basis conditions for the whole suite of accidents that I have to consider. Again, not an easy thing to do. All right, isolation. We talked about this again. I'm not going to dwell on this other than to say that this particular point here points out that you know we need to have the two isolation valves on each penetration to give us that extra level of redundancy to ensure that this function actually works. 
and they should be reliably and independently actuated. Okay. This is more on the requirements related to containment isolation. The requirements state that the isolation valve shall be located as close to the containment as is practicable. Again, the point there is is we're trying to prevent a uh, we're trying to prevent a situation where we have a penetration. Let's see here. Let me, uh, Marco, I'm going to get rid of your uh, stick figures here. Sorry. Uh, We have a situation here where we have, let's assume this is the containment wall. This is my, uh, this is my pipe. We've got an isolation valve here and an isolation valve here. Well, if I isolate, let's just say hypothetically that I, you know, that, that I have an isolation signal. Let's say this valve isolates, but this one fails for some reason. And then let's say I have if I have a lot of distance between here and the containment penetration, it's possible I could have a break on the inboard side of that valve, and then I have a release path. So the point is, make them as close as you possibly can. But there are obviously practical considerations that have to be taken into account within the containment structure, because again, containments are very big buildings, but they're full of a lot of stuff. And so you have to move things around very carefully and design the internal configuration very carefully. Okay. Okay, this is the containment isolation valve requirement that we talked about already more. Um, and then again, the modern thinking or the, the latest thinking on our isolation systems is we need to be able to consider the possibility of design extension conditions and that they will still function under those conditions, including the, all of the environmental challenges that we talked about. Okay. All right, so now we're, now we're moving on more to the internal design of the containment. I mean, why do you think it's, uh, it's important to have ample, ample design space inside the containment to allow sort of the free flow of, of air or gases or whatever it happens to be? I mean, what's the advantage of that in a containment? Any ideas? Pardon? Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a big one, yeah. If I can, you know, if I'm using, let's say I have my fan coolers going inside the containment and they're creating sort of like a recirculation flow, well, the, the, one of the advantages of that is, is is that can move the material around or the gas in the containment, which can tend to minimize local hydrogen concentrations. If I have a space where the air can't flow, well, and if it just happens to be that's where the hydrogen is, I'm going to have a local large concentration of hydrogen in that structure. So these are things that we have to consider as we're thinking about our containment. Um, this next bullet here is I want to, you know, these internal structures have to, you know, they're, they're, they're not necessarily designed to handle large internal pressure gradients. So I want to have a, so I, I don't want to have a situation where I have a space inside containment, which is highly pressurized next to one that's not highly pressurized. You know, the wall could fail if there's a door or some sort of, a, um, or you know, some sort of an opening that could blow open on that wall in order to relieve that pressure. I want to try to minimize that as much as I can because the internal structures, again, may not be designed to handle that kind of pressure differential. Okay. Oh, and again, uh, this is going to be a bullet you're going to see a lot during these presentations. We have to consider these design considerations in the presence, again, of what we call design extension conditions. Okay. Residual heat removal. Okay, now we're getting into systems design associated with the containment. I have a little more on this later to actually show some examples of some of the different configurations. But, you know, certainly for existing containment structures, ones that are operating today, you know, that, that they don't have the, the, these, these new passive heat removal systems that we've seen some pictures of, of these new plants. So I have to have an active system in order to remove heat. Now, one of the things that's done by some designers is is, uh, it, well, um, as you'll see, some of them use existing plant equipment. I've seen some situations where there's a specially designed system intended just for residual heat removal of the containment. The point is it has to be thought about. I have to have a system in place in order to reject heat from the containment in order to get the pressure down in the containment long term because the containment will most likely not be able to withstand high pressure 
long period of time. That's not real. That's not really structurally something that's going to work for the long period of time. So I always need to be able to get the system down to a safe and stable configuration, which is low pressure and low temperature. In order to do that, I have to be able to remove residual heat from the containment. Okay. And for this particular system, as you see here, we're going to apply the standard traditional design assumptions such as a single failure criterion. So it needs to, uh, so we have to think about, you know, just how many different independent systems we need in order to meet that criterion. Um, and then once again, we're bringing in this idea of design extension conditions. Okay, so next system we're going to talk about is we have to think about the internal atmosphere of the containment. You know, what are we going to do in order to try to minimize, I, I'm going to pick, out of this list, I'm going to pick hydrogen, for example. Because, again, we have some examples recently, unfortunately, of why hydrogen is a really, really bad thing. Um, but we have to think about systems that would allow us to minimize the hydrogen concentration, maybe even remove it from the containment, or maybe work on a way to, you know, perhaps we can even, like, you know, we can have, like, an inert gas. You see some containment structures that have been inerted to deal with hydrogen because there's not going to be a hydrogen explosion or deflagration if there's no oxygen. It's not, that's not possible. So, that's, so these are some of the design concepts that have been developed over the years to deal with that. The, uh, the point about fission product removal is really in order to try to remove the fission products from the containment so they're, they're, we don't have an uncontrolled release to the environment. What you find here sometimes is you'll see systems where there might be like a filtered release, for example, where you're going to relieve pressure in the containment, but it's going to go through a series of filtration devices in order to capture the fission products. But the point is I'm lowering the pressure and I'm retaining the fission products in a controlled fashion rather than an uncontrolled fashion. Okay. <clears throat> and again, here we're going to be applying the same design assumptions we do for all of our safety-related systems. We're thinking about, you know, single failure criterion is, is one of the examples mentioned here. Um, and I'm not going to say the last one again because I've said it already ten times. So I'll let you read that at your leisure. Okay, so let me pause here and ask, because I'm going to move on here now into showing some examples of different kinds of containment structures, and I want to go through some example calculations to show you, you know, how some of these requirements impact the designs that people have come up with over the years. But I wanted to pause here and ask, are there any questions about the requirements? Again, I realize they were more of a paraphrase of the requirements, but I wanted to use more of a, you know, more of a, uh, a more of a discussion approach rather than just reading the requirement that you can do at, uh, uh, on your own out of the document. So, any questions? Yeah, please. Um, I don't know if we have the mic. Let me, I think we're trying to use the mic here still, so let me, let me bring this down. Sir, regarding uh, this containment uh, uh, pressure building, mm -hmm. so this is you have uh, talked about the severe accident. Uh, what about the uh, pressure uh, release inside the reactor, inside the containment? Right. But in case of severe accident, whatever precaution you may take, there may be a rise of pressure inside the containment that need to be released. So, what is the requirement regarding venting? Okay. Well. Within our current set of safety standards requirements, we don't have requirements specifically directed towards venting. Marco, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we don't have any venting requirements. What we would say, say within the context of the design requirements, that would be left to the member states and to the designers to decide what's the best strategy. <clears throat> you know, are we going to, you know, are we going to have a venting solution? Um, are we going to have a filtered venting solution? Are we going to design the containment so we don't have to vent? In other words, it has enough free volume, and it has the ability to passively remove heat, for example, or even actively remove heat. So we don't have to address that question. I mean, there is, you know, right now, I, you know, I can't directly answer your question within the confines of the safety standards. We don't have specific directions on that. But I know it's definitely an area of active discussion amongst member states, and these are the general solutions people have tried to come up with. Um, but, but, uh, but the point is, what you're trying to avoid is a is having an uncontrolled release from containment. In other words, we don't want the containment to actually crack open and, and, and just have a direct release to the environment. 
that, that you know that's what the safety standards will be directing you to avoid certainly filtered venting or venting is one way to avoid that if you open the vent it's a controlled release pathway something you can monitor it you can filter it and it's certainly better than the alternative which would be to just have an uncontrolled release because sir, I, what I feel if uh, there is a design if the venting provision is not there then uh, we, we, we have not foreseen what kind of accident scenario can happen in future. So in that case, if you would not provide any design future for venting, so in, in any unforeseen accident condition like Fukushima, there may be a, some accident situation which could uh, rise the containment pressure so high that uh, if you will not provide the design of uh, venting pro design, then, uh, yeah. then the situation could be very bad. I can't disagree with you. I mean, you know, anything, you know, we can postulate any number of scenarios here, I expect, which could probably lead to an overpressurization of containment. But then the challenge becomes from the, from the regulatory authority, from the designer perspective, from the operator is, you know, how do I go from this large population of potential sequences and, you know, rule some of them out as things that are just simply not going to happen? In other words, you know, we're able to practically eliminate those sequences. And then when I get down to, to, to my next level of sequences, then I have to answer my. Then I have to ask this question: Can any of those sequences lead to an overpressurization of containment? If that can be, what am I going to do about it? And again, that's a that, that that's something that the member states have to deal with directly, because our because our requirements do not go to that level of depth. You know, we you know we you know we stipulate that there has to be the provision to maintain the containment below the prescribed pressure and temperature limits. How that's done is a design solution question, and there are and there are several ways of doing it. Uh, but it's definitely an area, as I said, of active discussion. People are talking about this. Um, you, you, know, you pointed out that the challenge for an existing plant, you know, you can't, you can't tear the containment off and build another one. That's just not practical. So you have to think about what am I going to do for a plant that's currently operating? You know, is the containment big enough? Do I need to, you know, do I need to add a vent? Do I need to add a filtered vent? Certainly, it's easier for a new plant, which I haven't built. Uh, because then I can try to apply some of these new passive solutions. I can just make it bigger. You know, I can have more free volume inside, et cetera. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not answering your question directly. And the reason is, is because I can't answer your question directly, because it has to be determined amongst the member states within their own regulatory requirements. But it's a good question. Very good question. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to move now, as I said, into sort of, um, I want to show you some demonstrations of different kinds of containments, and in this demonstration, I'll actually try to talk about some of the features that people have adapted over the years to, to, to address these questions of overpressurization, for example. This is not, by any means, going to be an exhaustive list, so I will just concede that up front. There are many, many different kinds of containments, and you know, it's just not possible to put them all in one presentation. This is intended, as I said, to show you some examples, and I want to use these to illustrate some various points <coughs> about different designs. <coughs> um, let's start with some comparisons. I think we've all seen that the BWR Mark I is a pretty small containment. This is the containment that was at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. It has an extremely high pressure bearing capa uh, capability. I apologize, these numbers here are, are actually in British units, uh, not atmospheres. These are in PSIG. Um, but it is a very, it's an extremely high pressure bearing structure, but the free volume is relatively small. The next evolution of BWR containments was called the Mark II. The, the free volume is a little bigger, but the design pressure is a little lower. Again, they were trying to optimize the design for these containments. The one thing to keep in mind here is what you're seeing here is engineering the containment to meet the DBA requirements. Again, you know, existing containments were not designed for severe accidents. Okay, the Mark I containment, for example, was not designed for the accident that it, that, that it, that, that, that it faced. It was designed for the large break loss of coolant accident. And this is how you see sort of this optimization evolving on this plot where designers tried to optimize the, the size of the structure versus its pressure bearing capability 
as they went through the evolution of their thinking. The next one on here is a PWR ice condenser containment. This is an example of this is an example of a PWR pressure suppression system. So it's uh, uh, you know it has a relatively large volume, but it also has a it also has a relatively low pressure bearing capability because again, it's the, the design concept was to keep the pressure low um, within the structure. And I have some pictures of this later on. Next up is the VWR Mark III. This containment is more of a traditional PWR type structure, a large free volume or larger free volume, relatively low pressure bearing capability. It's a concrete, um, um, I believe it's primarily a concrete structure, although I think some of them have actually been steel lined. And then we have PWR subatmospheric pressure containment. As the name implies, during operations, the, the containment is kept at, at a small amount of, uh, it, um, it has a small vacuum in the containment during operations. Uh, which is there to help you, which is there to deal with, which is there to help with some of the leak rate issues in containments. And the final one here is a PWR large dry, very, very large free volume, and a relatively high pressure bearing capability. So again, this shows the evolution and the thinking of the designers as they work through the different design concepts from the 1960s on. But again, what you see here is the structures that were designed for the design basis accident. And then over the years, they've been retrofitted to try to deal with some of the severe accident conditions that we've thought about over the years. They were not included in the original design. OK, three examples of BWR containments. On the left is the Mark I. In the middle is the Mark II. On the right is the Mark III. These, uh, the basic concept of the BWR uh, of uh, the BWR containment designed by GE is to use a pressure suppression system. In other words, we have a series, we have water inside the containment. It's always going to be low in the containment. This is an area called the wet well. And what happens during the design basis accident, again, we're thinking DBA here, the steam from the reactor vessel is going to be discharged into this, into this structure, either here, here, here. And that water is going to condense that steam. So in other words, it's going to suppress the pressure, hence the name pressure suppression containment. Now, from a design perspective, in order to meet the DBA pressure requirements, that led to the conclusion that we could have a relatively small free volume. The containment is this inverted light bulb shaped structure surrounded by, it's actually a metal structure surrounded by a concrete shield wall. In the Mark II, the, this is the containment structure here. It's a little bit bigger, and it's a concrete structure. And in the Mark III, again, we see this large, open, free volume here. So they move to more of like a pressurized water reactor concept with the Mark III design. OK. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is a blow up of a BWR Mark I. And, uh, I think I've already mentioned all these features. So, oh no, I didn't mention the last one here. Um, there was an evolution of thinking on the Mark I concept. Originally, Mark I containments w were not inerted. They, they didn't have an inert environment. As the concerns about severe accidents mounted or grew, it was determined that the Mark I free volume was a little on the small side. So one of the solutions that was developed to address potential hydrogen issues was to inert the atmosphere with an inert gas. I believe it's argon or, in, or maybe even nitrogen. I, I, I can't recall the exact gas that's used. But the point being, if I release hydrogen into that free volume, there's no oxygen. So I cannot have a deflagration or, or hydrogen explosion. That was the design solution that was developed to deal with the potential, um, with the potential of combustible gases. Okay. And what we see actually from the Fukushima example, it's interesting. Again, I, I caution that this is, this, this is not information that we know with absolute certainty because, again, quite a bit of the information from the accident we still, quite frankly, do not know because we have not been able to access the reactor buildings to go take a look and see what the current situation is. But all the indications are is that structurally the containment actually held. It didn't, you know, in other words, there was no hydrogen explosion or hydrogen deflagration inside the steel structure. Now, as we know, there were hydrogen explosions. What's been theorized, what's been calculated, 
some evidence that has been able to been gathered strongly suggests that there were leakage pathways from the containment structure into the reactor building. One of the most popular leakage path pathways is this flange. This is, this is actually this is just a dome that sits on a bolted flange, which can be lifted off to allow access to the containment and the reactor below. Um, it's been theorized that this flange yielded under the high pressure conditions and leaked the hydrogen into the reactor building into this upper space, which then led to, as we saw, the combustible mixture. But again, this is theory at this point. We don't have any facts to back this up. Well, we don't have many facts. We have some, but not enough to draw definitive conclusions. But all indications are, for this point, like I said, that the inerting feature actually did its job. Okay, so um, I think I've said enough about Mark I designs, Mark II and Mark III, so let me move on into uh, the Mark III here. Um, they continued to maintain the pressure suppression concept, but they came up with a significantly larger free volume. From a design perspective, that meant that they did not have to inert the atmosphere because it was argued based on calculations that for the design basis accident, we would, uh, we would never be able to achieve a combustible mixture. So these containments are not inerted. Um, in some cases, they have hydrogen igniters in them, as you see here, in order to deal with the possibility of hydrogen or other combustible gases. Okay, so as we move on, this is a picture. I'm going to move past this. I've already shown this to you. Okay, now these are these are different. These are uh, these are BWR containments that were designed that, that were designed by the Siemens company in Germany. The real thing I wanted to point out here is that you see some very similar features. They use a pressure suppression concept. You know, these, these are the different evolutions of the containments. And uh, that's, uh, that's a concept that, that, that's been adapted, to my knowledge, by most of the BWR designers around the world is to use a pressure suppression concept. That was the point that I really wanted to make on that, on that slide there. Okay, so let's stop for a minute here and talk about residual heat removal systems. So this is an example of a very high-level schematic of a layout of a residual heat removal system in a boiling water reactor. Now, it, as you can see here, it has multiple functions, and they're listed here. Now, now it can function as an ECCS system, emergency core cooling system, where I'm drawing water from either the external refueling water storage tank, or I'm drawing water from the suppression pool when I'm in a recirculation mode, as you think about how the system can function. So it, so, uh, so it can form part of ECCS. It also can be aligned to provide cooling to the various spaces in the containment. I can use, uh, I can use the, the, the RHR system to provide my dry well sprays, which are there to cool and also help, you know, uh, they also help to condense and remove certain gases in the system and get them down into the, uh, down into the suppression pool. I can apply the res residual heat removal system as a wet well spray. In other words, this is a spray system which is on top of the pool of water, which is at the bottom of the containment. Or I can also use it to, to provide cooling from the suppression pool. This is a closed loop cooling system fed to a heat exchanger in order to keep the suppression pool down below design limits. Okay, so this is just an example of a lineup. It's not, it's not, it's not the only way this is done around the world. Uh, but I wanted to make the point that we have systems, active systems, in order to meet the design requirements Know, of pressure and of pressure temperature in the containment and this is just one example again this system is designed to meet all of the design requirements that are necessary single failure criterion etc that we've already talked about throughout the last couple of days okay so can do systems I wanted to show some pictures here of the different kind of designs they have um, really all I wanted to point out here whoops is that uh, as Marco said, the CANDU system is a different reactor design. It doesn't have a pressure vessel per se. The pressure, the, the uh, reactor coolant system boundary are a series of horizontal pipes, which are fed into a header, um, which are then fed into a steam, which are then fed into a steam generator, which is pretty similar to a typical pressurized water reactor system. Okay, so I just wanted to leave this with you again as an example. This is an example of a VVER 1000 containment. 
The features here are pretty similar to what we call a to, to, uh, to what I call a large dry containment. It has very similar features. Very large free volume up and above. You see, they've given th you know they have different spaces in the containment, but the designers would have given consideration to again you know the ability to have the free flow of air between these spaces, so we're not building up high pressure areas. As you can see in this schematic, you know containments have quite a bit of equipment in them. You know, we have the reactor itself. We're going to have the pressurizer over here. We're going to have the steam generators around like this. Different, you know, we're going to have our ECCS pumps and stuff are going to be really low in the building in order to give us the, the highest possible net positive suction head during, the, you know, during uh, their demand. All of this equipment has to be considered within the spaces um, in terms of environmental qualifications. What kind of pressure or temperature am I going to see? over the long term for this equipment. But, um, so again, this is the point here. They're, they're very large structures, but they're very, uh, but they're very busy structures. They have quite a bit of equipment inside of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. BVR 440, this is an example of a pressure suppression structure. Uh, this, uh, this feature over here is the pressure suppression feature of the 440 containment design. That's really all I wanted to point out on this here. Um, it's just another example of how you can achieve that pressure suppression function. Okay, if we think about PWR containments, generally speaking, um, you know, we have the, the, the large dry versus pressure suppression. I've mentioned a couple of those already. I have some pictures in the next couple of slides. For the structural configuration, you're going to find various approaches. Some will have a steel structure surrounded by a con uh, surrounded by a concrete shield wall some will have reinforced concrete which actually have these really large like uh, these really large cables running through that we that we then secure to the base mat you actually put tension on these cables to keep the dome held down under these situations all these various kinds of design concepts have been developed over the years these are uh, these this is an example to show you a contrast between the two different ideas this is a large dry containment on the left. Again, what we see here is a very, very large open space. This again allows, you know, this is the volume to allow the containment to be able to, you know, hold and retain the energy released from the accident. Plus, it also has the advantage of giving us quite a bit of room inside to work. When we're doing work inside the containment structure, you know, we're going to have a crane structure on top to move heavy equipment around inside as we're doing refueling work or other maintenance. You see here the reactor vessel sets in, and here this shows the instrumentation lines for the in core instrumentation. We talked about this. These are going to actually, you know, these are going to actually go up to a containment penetration, which is going to go outside of the containment um, in, in order to allow the instrumentation to be fed ultimately into the control room. You know, the, uh, all these penetrations again would have to be would have to meet the design requirements that I talked about earlier, because they form part of the containment boundary. Okay, this is an example of an ice condenser containment. I don't know if you've ever heard of an ice condenser. Anyone heard of an ice condenser? Okay, well, this is a fairly unique concept. It's a very unique concept. I think there's only maybe one or two of these that were ever built. It's a pressure suppression containment. The way it does it is it has a series of actual ice baskets, which are kept as ice in the containment structure. During operation, so you have a, so you have to have a series of you have to have a series of, 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 of like refrigeration systems to keep the ice as ice during operations. The concept is the hot steam, the hot gas is going to be fed through these ice baskets, which will then melt. That's you know that's uh, that's going to condense the steam, so it's going to so, so it's going to suppress the pressure. Plus, it also gives me a source of internal water inside the containment, which I can then recirculate from the sump after I've exhausted my external tanks of water. It also allows me to have a slightly smaller free volume because, again, it's a pressure suppression concept. Uh, as I said, I only know one or two examples of this around the world that have been built. So it's a fairly unique containment idea, um, but I wanted to show it to you. Okay. It's an example of a large, dry, reinforced concrete containment. Uh, what we wanted to point out here, again, is just some of the features. You see the basic design concept is we have this very, very large open space. Again, we're trying to allow enough free volume to be able to handle the energy 
from the design basis accident and stay below the limits. Plus, it has an added advantage of giving us quite a bit of room to work inside containment. We can set a polar crane up on top so we can move heavy loads around as needed in order to do maintenance during outages, etc. cetera. Um, these, these spaces down here below in the containment are um, um, going to tend to house our equipment. You know, we're going to put, you know, that, that's where we're going to have like our ECCS pumps and, um, and, and, and whatnot because we want to have them very low in order to have the, the necessary net positive suction head during a demand as needed during, you know, during the design basis accident. Okay. All right. This is a large pre-stressed or pre-tensioned concrete containment. The, the point I wanted to make here is, is that actually what happens here is so the reinforced concrete structure, and then inside the structure, I have a series of, of uh, what really amounts to very large wires that I feed through the containment structure all the way around. And I secure down on the base mat here. And then I actually take those wires and I actually pull them down. That, OK, that's intended to you know, add, add, add a, you know, Add, add this kind of pre-stressing to the containment, which gives it which gives it added strength. So this is a concept that you'll see again. This is uh, I don't think this is one of the more common, but it, but it is out there. Okay, all right. So I'm going to move on um, to the next discussion about different kinds of systems. Any questions on the pictures? I know some of them are a little different. There are some unique concepts out there. Again, these are for existing plants. As you, as we've shown, as you would see if you go to the internet, as Marco said earlier, you're going to find a lot of fancy pictures of a lot of new concepts. Most of them are going to employ passive technologies. They're going to have larger free volumes. Um, you know, they're going to have the added advantage, uh, the added advantage of being able to be designed up front to deal with design extension conditions, not have to be retrofitted to deal with these kinds of conditions. Okay, so moving on here, residual heat removal system. Well, what I wanted to point out here is how the, the heat removal systems work in general for the containment. You know, we have a source of water, right? We, uh, we, we talked about this. If we think about the, the, the ECCS systems or, you know, the emergency core <coughs> cooling systems or our heat removal systems, our safety requirements stipulate that we have to think about how much water I need, right? I, I, I'm going to have a big tank somewhere, I'm going to have a reservoir, somewhere I have to have an external source of water that I can use to inject into the reactor if I have a design basis accident. Okay. Now that water is not unlimited. I mean, there's no way to have an unlimited supply of water in the reactor. It's just, it's just not possible. You'd have to have a huge tank farm or some you know, huge source of water that you can access. So the concept is I'm going to inject water either through ECCS or through one of my containment uh, injection systems. In this case, this uses the refueling water storage tank, which is a pretty typical source of water that you're going to find designers are going to use. ECCS systems, systems for containment heat removal will be aligned with, with, with during normal operations with, 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 uh, with their suction source aligned to this tank. So what happens when this tank runs dry, when it's out of water? I mean, what are you going to do? Recirc mode, yeah. You, uh, you're going to shift to recirculation, okay? Now, there's going to be instrumentation. Again, this brings in the instrumentation part. It has to be safety-related instrumentation because it's actuating a safety function. It's going to be assumed in my safety analysis. I need to know when this water gets low enough in this tank that i got to start thinking about switching over to recirculation because if I don't do that, all my pumps are going to be sucking air, and pumps don't like to suck air. Okay, the pumps will cavitate, the pumps could damage themselves, so this is a very critical action that has to be taken, either manually or automatically, depending on the configuration, to make sure that I can shift my water source over to the sump, and I'm going to start recirculating. Okay, but now I have another problem. I'm no longer injecting water inside the reactor, or inside the containment, it's now this isolated system. I have to be able to figure out how to get heat out of it, right? or the pressure is just going to keep going up and up and up. So we see here we have a heat, you know, we have a heat removal system. In this case, it's shown as, I, 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 you know, I have a, 
Uh, I have a fan that draws air into a heat exchanger out to my heat sink. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is another example of how this could work. I could draw from the sump into, into the heat sink, and then, and then I'm going to put water back in through some sort of recirculation mode with the containment sprays. It's just various examples of how a designer could approach this. The point being, it has to be thought about because in order to meet the safety requirement on maintaining pressure temperature limits, I have to have some kind of means of removing heat. And I also have to have a means of doing it long term. I can't just think about, you know, the first 5, 10, 15 minutes of an accident. I need to have water supplies for a very long, you know, for, for, for a time period prescribed by, uh, by the regulatory authorities. And then I have to have the ability to shift over to recirculation. And I have to have the ability then to reject heat from the containment atmosphere, or it's just going to keep heating up. OK. Uh, ice condensers, I'm going to move past this, because these are a very specialized system. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. OK. All right, so now we're moving into safety analysis. So let me pause here again and ask if there are any questions about what I've talked about so far. No questions. OK. All right, so uh, what you're going to find here, a lot of this is pretty typical. We've talked about some of this already, the kinds of things we have to think about when we're, when, when we're setting up to do a deterministic safety analysis. Um, I need to think about, obviously, my you know, series of postulated accidents. That's going, to be, that's going to be DBAs. It's going to be deck conditions, depending upon requirements, and how I'm going to set up the number of sequences that I'm going to analyze. But then on top of that, as we, as we do typically, I have to think about, you know, what other initiating events can I, do I have to worry about in the containment structure? Some of these can be equipment failures. Uh, uh, like, for example, I could have a DBA in the containment, which, you know, which, well, which is related to a failure of a particular piece of equipment, which could then lead to damage in the reactor, which, which could then lead to a load inside the containment. This could be, for example, some sort of like, um, well, I guess really the large break loss of coolant accident is really the best example of an equipment failure. Uh, we have think of human errors. We talked about this already. Uh, um, other internal events. These are some of the unique events that I have to think about in the containment loading structure. Fires, internal <coughs> explosions. Uh, if I have an internal flood, for example, you know, we think about the design of my containment or, or how I'm going to analyze it and what equipment is available. Um, if you walk into a containment, there's a lot of pipes running around in the containment for various systems. Some of them are carrying steam, some are carrying hot water, some are carrying cold water. Well, you know, if I walk into a space and I look down and, you know, I have, let's say hypothetically I have a space where I have the equipment I need to operate my containment cooling system and I have a huge pipe running through the upper part of that containment, that space, well, I have a flooding hazard there, right? If that pipe breaks, that equipment's going to be flooded and it's not going to work. So I have to think about these things as I, as I set up my analysis for what kind of equipment I'm going to have available to me to, to mitigate the consequences of the event. Uh, for containments, I have to think about external events. I have to think about, you know, high winds. You know, high winds can create, you know, missiles, you know, can lift things up that can actually hit the side of the containment structure. Obviously, we, obviously we have to think about seismic events. We think about flooding, obviously. We've seen that. Uh, all of these things can, can challenge the containment. One of the things we're learning, or uh, that we've learned as a result of Fukushima, is we think about the combination of external events. You know, the combination of a seismic event leading to a tsunami, which can then cause damage to facilities. That's kind of a new style of thinking, things we hadn't really thought about before in our, um, in, in our approach to safety analysis. As with any good calculation, I need a lot of data. I have to know the specifications of the containment. I need to know the general configuration. I need to know things like, you know, what is you know, the radius of this arc of the dome? What's the free volume? You know, I, I have to know down here, I'm going to have to know, um, you know, what kind of structural material am I using? Is it steel? Is it welded joints? Is it concrete, reinforced concrete, stainless steel, carbon steel? These things all matter when I'm doing a structural analysis of containment. I have to know all of those details. Uh, I have no details about the penetrations. Again, we talked about seals. You know, every penetration has to have a seal on it. 
you know, what's the seal design? Is it something that happens to maybe be susceptible to high temperature? It's going to fail under high. It's going to fail in high temperature conditions. Is it going to fail under high pressure? You know, what's the actual material itself? I need to consider that in my calculations. Welded. Um, obviously, in a structure, welded locations are going to be your weak points. I need to know where they are. When I'm doing any kind of structural loading calculation, I have to think about the welded joints because that's a possible failure location. Getting down a little more detail here. It, it, you know, it actually matters what kind of concrete I have. You know, what's the you know what's the aggregate of the concrete? You know, what, what what's the size of the rebar and the reinforcing concrete? How were they placed in the concrete? These are things that matter when when I'm thinking about a structural analysis. What type of steel type, for example? I showed you a picture of the what we uh, what we call the pretensioned containment, the ones that have those big tensioning wires going through the dome down to the base mat where they're secured and then pulled tight. You know, what's the pretension? What's the size of the wire? And again, seal design and competition, and seal design and composition, okay. And obviously I'm going to feed my results of testing into my calculations. If I have a test that shows that the containment has a certain type of performance, well, I'm going to use that in my calculations. One such example would be leak rate, for example, but when I'm thinking about source term. Okay, definition of potential loads, okay? These are two examples. The one on the left I would call an impulse load. If you look at the time scale here, this is over, what, this is less than a second, this pressure load here. What could lead to something like this? We, we talked about it already. You know, this kind of rapid, rapid pressurization. What could lead to that in a containment? We talked about it during Marco's last presentation. Any ideas? Talk about, pardon? Uh, no, not really. Those don't happen that fast. I, I'm, I'm thinking about direct containment heating. Let's say I have a high pressure ejection from the reactor vessel of molten corium into the containment atmosphere. It will lead to this kind of an impulse load on the containment structure. Pardon? Well, it's possible if the containment fails. It's a possibility. I, I don't know the details of this exact calculation, but most likely maybe there was, maybe at this point, uh, they predicted a containment failure and then uh, the pressure went down. It's possible. I'm not sure. I don't know the exact details of this calculation. This is intended to be an example. It's a good question, though. You know, you're going to have that energy in the containment. Probably what I would expect would happen is you're going to have this impulse load. It's going to drop back down, and then it's going to equilibrate at some higher elevated pressure if the containment survives. That's an if, because you don't know. Again, this is why we want to avoid that. Okay, the, on, on, on the right-hand side, you see a more traditional, typical calculation of pressure in containment. This happens over the series of, of you know, from 10 to 40 hours. It's a very, very long event as the containment just sits there and heats up. It takes a long time for the containment to heat up, heat up and pressurize. It's a very large structure. It's very, um, um, there's a very large amount of, of internal volume. Most likely what happened under these conditions when you see, the, see this rapid drop was they predicted a failure of the containment in these calculations, and the containment just dropped back down to atmospheric pressure. So that's probably what you're seeing there in these simulations. Okay. Um, we talk about, again, we can't talk about a computer code calculation without talking about uncertainties. I mean, they go hand in hand because we have to do that in order to ha have a reliable answer. Um, you know, we have uncertainty about, about the free volumes in the containment. You know, we have a design of containment. But you know, realistically speaking, unless someone goes out and sits in the containment space with a laser and sits there and physically maps the actual location of every wall and every curve and every corner, probably the, the design volume is not going to exactly match the as-built volume. It'll be close, but it's not going to be exactly the same. So there's uncertainty there with your source of data on the volume. Heat structures, this really is internal walls and structures. You know, what are the thicknesses of the containment, the exact material composition? Again, we have a design specification. It'll be really close, but it's probably not going to be perfect as we built it. We have uncertainty about the initiating and boundary conditions. Again, you'll find if we go back to the design basis accident analysis situation, we have the large break loss of cooling calculation. 
one of the most challenging things to model in that calculation is the rate of flow of steam from the reactor coolant system. Even today, that's a very challenging thing to model. We have ample data sources out there. There's still uncertainty. I mean, what happens in the pipe nozzle itself after the pipe breaks, the steam will achieve a sonic velocity at that point. It's a condition called choked flow because it cannot exceed that velocity because that is the maximum velocity under those conditions. But the ability to calculate the sonic velocity of steam under those conditions is very challenging. And we can't calculate it from first principles in our codes, so we have to use a series of models. To model it with empirical data taken from experiments, again, it's pretty good, but it's a source of uncertainty. Heat transfer conditions, again, we're talking here about you know, heat transfer along the various internal structures. Am I going to have an evaporating wall? Am I going to have a condensing wall? Am I going to have, you know, rain falling inside from an upper structure that has water on it, which is then, you know, which, uh, uh, which is then condensing on, um, inside the structure? Are the surfaces of the inside of the dome going to be wet? They're going to be dry? All of that affects the heat transfer under these conditions. It's, um, it's very, very complicated. All right, so now we move on to the codes themselves. I listed three of the more common, is there a question? No. I, I listed three of the more common examples that I'm personally familiar with. There are others. These are not the only codes out there that do this kind of calculation. These are some examples of some of the phenomena that I have to worry about. But again, unfortunately, these are examples of phenomena that are very difficult to predict with a code. I cannot model these from first principles. What I need then is data. I need test data to be able to verify and validate that the code works. Now we have a particularly unique problem in a containment is that it's just so big. I'm not going to go build a containment to take test data. It's just, it's just not possible. We always have to do scale testing. And what happens when we introduce scale into a test facility? You know, there's, I have to make it smaller. I have to shrink it. Because there's no way I can build a containment structure to run test data. It's just, it's just not possible. So the effects of scale have to be considered. This is something that, and the, uh, the basic problem that we talked about in our basic engineering courses is the same here. It's impossible to scale both velocity and buoyancy forces correctly at the same time. It's just not physically possible. It cannot be done. So I have to compromise in my experimental design. What am I more interested in? Buoyancy forces, you know, viscosity, et cetera, in order to have a facility that I can actually build and that I can actually take data in. There are several examples of these around the world. I know there's some in the Russian Federation. There's some testing in France. There's some test facilities in the U.S. There's some test facilities in Germany. All of these facilities have been built. They're an excellent source of data for us. But the point is we have to understand what the data means when we use it in our code verification and validation. OK. User effect. Oh, boy, we've talked about that. That's me sitting behind the computer typing. If I make a mistake, I choose a bad model. That's user effect. It happens. OK. This is an example of how these codes are going to link together. Again, the point I wanted to make here is Relap 5, in this case, this again is an example. It's not the only code that does this. There, there are many codes around the world that calculate the design basis accident in the light water reactor. Effectively, it becomes a source term for the containment calculation. In this case, I chose to talk about a code called Gothic. It's just another example. So I take that energy from the reactor, I put it in the containment, I use Gothic to calculate what I want to know, pressure, temperature, hydrogen concentration, fission gas, you know, locations, et cetera, to demonstrate that I can meet my safety requirements for the design basis accident or whatever the requirements might be for design extension conditions. This is an example of a nodalization for another code called MAP. The point I wanted to make here is, I mean, you know, this is the actual calculational scheme that's in the code. And I think I can probably count the notes here, maybe on, uh, maybe on two hands and, and maybe have a finger or two left over. But this kind of shows you the level of detail that you model in these containment codes. The practical reality of this is, is, you know, we think about our basic numerical methods. You know, what do we do in numerical methods? We take a space, 
we break it up into small chunks to allow us to create a series of ordinary differential equations that we can then easily solve by linking them together. You know, we break it down into a series of nodes. Okay, it's basic numerical methods. We do the same thing here, except we set a node which is the size of the containment free volume. It's huge. Okay, so what that means is there's a lot of physics that's going on inside that node that I cannot model. You know, the length scale of some of these processes I have to worry about are, you know, on the order of, uh, like, you know, millimeters. And when I think about evaporation on the wall, it's a very small length scale. I don't have anywhere near the amount of nodalization to come to grips with that phenomenon from first principles. So, as any good code developer would do, they go back and put it empirical models, data, to make the code work. The point is, is these codes... You know, in order to have a practically solvable problem, one that's going to not take months and months and months of computer time, I have to set up this kind of nodalization scheme. All right. So, uh, these are some example, whoops, that didn't work. Example calculations of the large break loss of coolant accident, for example. I'm not going to go through the details here. I just wanted to show you this is kind of a typical result you're going to find for the various... Uh, the various variables of interest. I start with my, on the left hand, upper left hand side, the actual reactor. I build my Relap 5 model in the upper right hand side, and then I use that model to predict that in the bottom. For my containment, I'm going to do the same thing. I have my containment, my plant layout here on the left. To build my containment model, you see a series of nodes and junctions and volumes. And then I do my calculation in the bottom. The point here is I need to link this to this. This is the source term for this calculation, and so they're linked together. And another point here is you'll note the very large different degree of refinement in the calculation. The reactor system, I have a pretty detailed set of nodalization in order to allow me to get a pretty good resolution on the answer. In the containment, I do not. Now again, you know, there are codes that have you know, higher level of resolution in the containment calculation, but in the end, there are practical limits on what we can do. We're simply never going to be able to model with current technology the containment down to the level of the reactor system. We just, it's just not practical on computers to do that because the, the space is just way too big. Okay, um, DBA pressure analysis. I don't want to dwell on this other than to say these are the kinds, these are some of the kinds of sequences I have to worry about. And this also shows how the various chapters of the FSAR or the PSAR will link together to give me the information that I need to do a reliable calculation. Okay. Uh, DBA containment pressure analysis. This is, this is just more detail on one particular sequence. So I'm going to go past this. DBA pressure analysis again. This is just more detail on that. I'm going to leave this for your reference. You'll have this information. Because I wanted to get to one particular point here, which is, I think this is it, right? Yeah, which is right here. This just shows an example, again, of some detailed calculations inside the containment. But the point I wanted to make here is, and this is in this lower right-hand plot here, you'll see where it says in this box, it says I'm doing a switch over to recirculation. Okay. Now this is this is probably one of two things. It's, it's going to be driven either by an assumption of the analyst or it'll be driven by the time when the refueling water storage tank is beginning to run dry and you get a low level alarm and the operator either has to take manual action or has to, uh, has to rely on the automatic actuation to function. And the point is you see the impact here. You know, this is a change in, 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 in how the system functions and how it's modeled. And you can see that, you know, if you follow that curve along after that, you'll see that it actually changes the characteristics of the plot. And there's a point I wanted to make there. Okay. Equipment qualification is the next, and I, and I believe the final point I wanted to make in this presentation. The point here is, I, I, I'm not going to walk through this entire logic chart here because it's very detailed, and again, you'll have it. If you walk through this logic chart, you're going to get to a series of questions on the right-hand side here where you would estimate for any, any high-pressure component in the reactor. I'm going to ask myself questions of, uh, 
you know, am I meeting these criterion? In other words, if I have a high pressure pipe in the space, in the containment, where I also happen to have a piece of equipment, I assume that pipe breaks, what are the conditions? What are the radiological conditions, pressure, temperature, et cetera? If I meet these series of conditions on the right-hand side, then, um, as it says here, SSC requalification not required. If I don't meet them, I got to go back to my INC technician, to my pump designer, to whatever that particular component is, and say, hey, look, here's my new equipment, or, you know, these are the new environmental conditions. Will the equipment survive? Do I need to buy a new piece of equipment? Do I need to requalify it, et cetera? These are, this, is, this is an example of a logic chart that I wanted to show you. Okay. Um, this, is a, a, this is kind of a higher level pictorial of what I just told you, so I'm going to pass through this. And this, again, is a specific example for a VVR reactor, generic VVR reactor, which links from the particular high energy line break on the left hand side, or HELB talks about the specific node in the Relap 5 code, where that line is. It lines it up with the node in the Melkor code. I have a calculational reference on the far right-hand side. And then the bottom chart gives me the actual results. And so from this, one could deduce whether or not the equipment that's in that particular space will meet the environmental requirements that are necessary from the calculated results. This is just an example of the calculations of some of these calculations shown in this table. Okay, and here again is another set of examples. Uh, this particular one is for hydrogen. And this is an example picture of hydrogen distribution calculations. I believe this is, what code is this? Uh, this is Gothic again, which is applied to the Kursko reactor, which is a Westinghouse two-loop pressurized water reactor. And these kind of calculations here, again, I apologize for going through this kind of quickly, but I wanted to leave some time for questions here. These calculations I do for hydrogen, again, this is an example of the hydrogen distribution as a function of time in these various spaces. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the actual containment itself. Left-hand side, you see the mathematical representation in the Gothic code. In the next plot, I see the results. Okay, this is on the, the, uh, this, this is on the traditional hydrogen distribution plot. And it shows as long as I stay outside of this triangle here, which is the red results, it shows that I should not have a hydrogen deflagration or hydrogen explosion. This is a result of a hydrogen calculation. Okay. Uh, this explains those results in some detail, but again, the bottom line is, as you can see from these plots, for that particular sequence, those particular set of equipment, and the particular set of assumptions, I'm able to demonstrate that I, do, uh, that I should not have a hydrogen deflagration concern based on that simulation. Okay, and summary. As we saw, containment design features vary considerably. I mean, I didn't even, sh you know, I showed you some. That's not all. There are even others out there. Um, and the details are important to understanding containment response during the design basis or what we now call design extension conditions. And those kind of details are things like, you know, the source term from the reactor system during the, during the event. What are the, you know, what, what are the specific design parameters of the containment? And how is it made? What's it made of? What are the free volumes, et cetera. So with that, let me ask if there are any questions. And again, I'm sorry for rushing a little bit at the end, but I uh, wanted to leave time for questions. Wow. Everybody must be tired. Maybe that's it. No questions? OK. Any questions about anything? On the schedule, we have a discussion session here set up for the next half an hour, and I wanted to just open it up for any, uh, any thoughts, any ideas. No. Okay. All right.